hidden in plain sight. For those of you who may be here for the first time today, um, it's a series that I'm uh, preaching. This is my third message because God put it in my heart to just begin to expose spiritual things. I really am weary of everybody else being so forward, for lack of a better word, with not, not minding, not being scared, not being intimidated to try to engage the supernatural and the church is just so silent. And the fact is you're supposed to be just as spiritual as you are physical. Uh, the fact is, you are a spirit being that will live forever. <clears throat> you're in a body here temporarily. And you're supposed to be able to have spiritual senses. You're supposed to be able to access spiritual things. Uh, we, we medicate and therapy everything, and sometimes it's just a devil. And like I said, you can't medicate and you can't counsel a demon. They don't counsel. They don't medicate. And nobody talks about this because in the church it's like it's weird, but Hollywood has no problem with it. And Hollywood will let you see somebody demon possessed and their head spin around on their neck four times and they don't have no problem with that. And most of that stuff you see is not the way the enemy manifests himself because that is the most brutal manifestation of his pure evil. And most of the time when you see manifestations like that, it's in jungled regions, it's in tribal areas where witch doctors and all those things are very, very common. And you see just, just very, you see lots of darkness. And when you come in there with the gospel, you just see two worlds collide. But in our everyday life, uh, there's not people with goo running out their mouth and no eyeballs in their eye sockets and their head turning around. It's that stuff where he's, got your life locked in a cycle and you can't see it but you can't get away from it and we've been talking about that the first two weeks we talked about curses curses are real curses are real blessings are real God said these are the way the blessings Deuteronomy 28 and he said this is what I'll bring the curses and then he said you choose okay so if any of us have a life that it feels like it's just cursed. The word curse means a downward pull, okay? A curse is not a, a witch with a green face twisting something and saying words. It means a downward pull. There's something that is given legal right in your life, in your bloodline, in your family, where in certain areas, there's always a downward pull. That's what that means. And if you haven't had a chance to read Deuteronomy 28 yet, you need to read that whole chapter before you go to bed tonight because it is powerful. And he said, if you hearken to the voice of the Lord this day to diligently obey all these things which I've commanded you, all these blessings shall come upon you. Very simple. The blessing is you be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. You will be empowered to prosper if you are diligently seeking to obey these things. He said, but if you do not, then all these curses shall, listen, come upon you, pursue you, and overtake you. A curse is progressive in nature. It comes upon, it continues chasing, and it don't stop until it's tried to destroy you. And he said, and if you don't do these things, then these curses have permission to chase you. And so they're now, 2022, people fighting things and don't know what they're fighting. And the church is silent. And so I just like, you know what? I'm just gonna open a whole can up. We are having through the roof numbers in our virtual services from this topic. Our, our YouTube views from these clips on curses exploded the last two weeks. Why, you know why? Because people like, thank God, somebody's telling me what I'm dealing with. <laughs> and so today, I told you I was gonna move from the curses to another form of the enemy's devices and it's called the yoke. I wanna talk about the yoke. What is the yoke? What does it look like? Are y'all here? Are we all right in the building? How many of you are very interested in this teaching series? Okay, we're gonna talk about the yoke and we're gonna talk about what breaks that yoke in the next few minutes. I'm excited about this. I don't know if you can tell or not. I don't wear pink and orange very often. That means I'm excited. <laughs> so Father, I ask you to bless our time together, uh, these amazing people have given their time because they want something to change their life. 
And I just pray that these words that go forth in the next few minutes be so liberating, so liberating. So anoint me, Lord, and give me the supernatural grace to communicate it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Tell your neighbor, here we go, neighbor, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm dating myself a little bit, but how many of you are old enough to remember a movie called Groundhog Day? <laughs> I don't know, late 80s, maybe 1990, someone. Groundhog Day, for those of you who don't know, I can see all the millennials looking at each other. <laughs> was a movie about a, a man who needed to be changed. And so he ended up in a cycle where he woke up and every day it was the same day. And nothing progressed. Nothing moved forward. Every day, same scenery. Same stuff. Same people. Life did not move forward because of the cycle he was in. The cycle was brought about to bring a change in the man. And soon when his heart and his attitude was changed, you know, he was freed from the cycle. Good story, not really biblical. Except for one part of it. A lot of us have Groundhog Day marriages. <clears throat> got kids, don't have kids, kids are grown, kids are out, don't matter, it's just Groundhog Day. It's the same problem, the same problem. I remember when I used to do all the counseling myself when I didn't have any help from staff, I'd have people come in. This has been going on for 22 years. It, it, that most of the time the problems had not come up in the last two weeks. Something that they just keep turning the pages on the calendar and the problem still exists no matter what season they're in. Groundhog Day marriages. Groundhog Day finances, those are interesting. To see people get six different jobs, six different promotions, and six different raises and still don't have enough money. It don't matter what level of life they're on or how they are compensated. It's never enough. They are trapped in lack. It doesn't matter if you make a million dollars a day if you owe a million and one. <laughs> doesn't matter. I've seen people in Groundhog Day finances. I've seen people in Groundhog Day addictions. They were addicted in their teens and it came into their 20s and it permeated in their 30s. They lost everything in their 40s. They're all alone in their fitness. And it's just Groundhog Day, Groundhog Day over and over and over again. I see it in relationships. They attract the same kind of people. They end up around losers. Come on, somebody. Every single time. They invite the people in their life that reinforce their weaknesses and they don't even know why. Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. I am preaching good. It's already good. <laughs> now, let's just be vulnerable a minute, and I'm the first one with my hand up. How many of you have experienced some type of Groundhog Day in your life, in some area of your life? Yeah, okay. I want to talk about that and the reasons for it in the next few minutes. And some of you waiting for me to preach, I don't know how much I'm going to holler and sweat today. I just have information. It's going to change your life. And I want to make sure I communicate it and communicate it. I've got written stuff. I've got stuff in Magic Marker. I got my iPad. I told him, I said, I can't do my iPad stand today. I need a whole table. So uh, I'm going to take these next 20, 25 minutes and give you some great stuff. <clears throat> Science calls it nature versus nurture. The Bible calls it generational curses versus yokes. <clears throat> Nature is what happens to you. Nurture is what was in you when you got here. And that's what science tries to say, which one's most popular? They're, I mean, which one's most powerful? They're both very powerful. And then we come over to the Bible. And I talked to you last week about generational curses, cur uh, curses that go three and four generations deep. That when that baby is born, there's something inside of it called iniquity. And that word iniquity means bent. So when that child is born, he hasn't, had, he hasn't had any TV shows to watch. He hasn't had a phone, never been on the internet, never been exposed to anything. <clears throat> and he's already got momentum on the inside of him, taking him toward a certain lifestyle. 
already. And it's called generational curse. It's called the iniquity of the fathers visiting the third and fourth generation. I read it to you in Exodus 20 last week. And we talked about those iniquities and we talked about the fact that Jesus was wounded for transgressions. Those are your outward sins, but he was bruised for iniquity. He bled on the inside for the wheel that you've got turning on the inside. He bled on the inside for the things on the inside of you that's trying to carry you in a certain lifestyle that sabotages you. He bled for what you did outwardly and he bled for the struggle that you don't want anybody to know about. So you are absolutely saved even if you're still experiencing the struggle. (laughs) Jesus bought forgiveness for that. Okay? Generational curses are the things that are passed through bloodlines just like brown eyes, just like blonde hair, just like tall, skinny, chubby, thick, fat, whatever we wanna call them, those things can all be passed, but those are not the only things you get from your parents. I told you last week, even the medical field knows when you come in, they start asking, well, did your daddy have high blood pressure? Well, has high blood pressure in your family? Has there ever been heart disease in your family? Has anybody else ever had cancer? Is anybody else a diabetic? Why? Because they know if they can trace it through the bloodline, they can help diagnose you even the medical field. So we have generational sicknesses that they keep revisiting and revisiting. Somebody asked me yesterday, said, Ron, you ever had high blood pressure? I said, excuse me, the day before yesterday. Uh, I said, yes, I have very high at one time. And I said, I was hospitalized for it. And they said, when? I said, age 35. So I went back and asked my mama, I said, mama, I'm in the hospital because they cannot bring my blood pressure down. I said, is this anywhere in my family? She said, your dad had it awful. Uh, She said, he was hospitalized. I said, when? She said, he was 35. (laughs) Not just the same thing, but the same season in life. It manifested in me just like it manifested in him. You need to tell your neighbor, say, relax. We got to go through the bad to get to the good. Come on. I know some of y'all like, man, I'm going to go ahead and take a whole bottle of Xanax today. Crap. (laughs) Just roll with me. You got to address it to get liberated from it. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to diagnose the problem before we shoot it full of medicine. Come on, help me now. So these are the things that we need to understand that the enemy wants to sabotage life through what came through the bloodline. He wants you to be strapped by it, trapped by it, and never get away from it. Those are called generational curses. Those are things that come through the family that keep your life pulled in a downward spiral like gravity. Are we clear about that? Now let me move to the new stuff. Okay, Isaiah 10, verse 27. Isaiah 10, verse 27. It shall come to pass in that day, talking about the day we're living in. Remember, the prophets didn't all look at the end times. They looked into the day of grace with Jesus. They longed for the day you get to live in and I get to live in. So in the day we're living in, it shall come to pass that God's going to move like this. The burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. What's going to destroy it? And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Do you know how few churches this morning even say the word anointing? But the fact is, if I'm not anointed, you don't want me to be up here. Oh, that's the biggest waste of your time in the world. The anointing means the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, his residency. That's what it means. In the Old Testament, it was actual oil. And God told them how to mix the oil according to the art of the perfumer. In the New Testament, remember, Old Testament, everything is outer and physical. In the New Testament, everything's inner and spiritual. So now in the New Testament, it's not oil in a jar. It's the oil that comes from the Holy Spirit living on the inside of God's people. The anointing, stay with me now, this is important. Some of you have heard it all your life. Some of you have never heard it. The anointing is not just for people with microphones and on a stage. I need everybody to make this confession with me. I am anointed. Say that, I am anointed. I don't need to touch your child if he wakes up with 103 fever. 
You can touch your child and break that fever in the name of Jesus. You need to understand that you're a nun. You don't have to get somebody to church to be healed. The healing is not in this building. The healing is in you. You're the building. You're the, this ain't the church. You're the church. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And wherever you go, you're carrying the Holy Spirit with you. God shows up when you show up. God shows up to the fever when you show up. God shows up with a miracle when you show up. Whatever God's going to do, he's going to use you to do it somebody say I'm the miracle everybody in this room is anointed all of you have an anointing when you get saved the Spirit of God comes and lives on the inside of you there's a subsequent experience where you get filled get baptized in the Holy Spirit and you begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance and that's when the gifts of the Spirit come alive and those gifts are healing miracles tongues interpretations of tongues words of wisdom words of knowledge and it's not just for church it's the prophetic man if you're a stockbroker how powerful would it be to have the prophetic just pay tithe off of it. <laughs> when your company has a problem that cannot be solved, how powerful would it be for you to be sitting there with a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge? God just downloads information in you that you never studied in your life and you have an answer for your company's dilemma. That stuff ain't just for churches, for your life. God, we got to start talking about this. We are missing out on so much. And Isaiah said, in that day, when people have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them and they become the temple of the Holy Spirit, it shall be that anointing that will destroy the yoke and will lift the burden. Can I go a little bit deeper? We got time? Now, who? In the Old Testament, a yoke was something that was used for oxen. You know, one thing that surprised me when I moved uh, and began to, to pastor on the West Coast is uh, the TV never shows all the agriculture that's here. Whenever you see TV, you see San Francisco, LA, and San Diego. But I just, I never knew all the agriculture, beautiful agriculture. And um, you see all the heavy machinery with which they tend the land. Yes. You got to understand in Old Testament, the ground was just as hard. It had to be turned over to be made ready for seed. And men did not have the strength to do that. That's why you see that blue diesel smoke blowing out that smokestack on that tractor when that disc goes down in that ground, because that's a hard pull. And the job of that disc when it's planting season is to take the hard ground and turn it upside down and bring the supple ground to the surface so that it can have seed. <laughs> so they used the ox. The ox was a beast of burden. It had the ability to pull unbelievable amounts of weight to shoulder much of the weight of what it would take to till the land. So here's the imagery that the Bible is speaking from. An ox was too great a beast to be controlled once it was mature. A six foot two, 200 pound man, it was not going to control an ox. So what would they do? They would take the ox in its youth and put a yoke around its neck. And as the ox grew, the only thing the ox knew was the yoke. Good God Almighty. So the ox's life would take on the pattern of the yoke. And it could be controlled by that yoke, even though in reality it had power to overpower the person controlling it but it didn't know it because it had been yoked so early in life, it grew and all it knew was the yoke. 
So you have the generational curses, nature. But for those of you who need scientific data, now we have nurture. Why do you think there is an unbelievable assault of perversion on our youth? I've never seen a generation more confused in all my life. <laughs> and the first thing the enemy does when he wants to sabotage a life is steal identity. And we got a generation that don't know who they are, so everybody's telling them, choose what you are. <laughs> now, one thing I'm going to tell you, I'm going to preach it straight. <laughs> you know Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, when they put them in the fiery furnace? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's not their name. The first thing the king did was change their name. Because if he can change their idea... <laughs> Jesus never did anything till his father showed up and said, you are my son. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Then he went out and started performing miracles. That's why there's been an assault on the family. Because there is a part of the identity that's shaped in a child that only a father can bring. Fathers, you cannot be absent from your kid's life. Whether you're a single parent or whether you're married, you have got to be there. Because identity gets lost when you do not speak. To speak. Man, this is good stuff. I'm glad I'm not having to do all them calisthenics today because I'm too hot. Now, this is going to be a little rough to hear, but walk with me. So he lets a seven year old get molested. And 40 years old, sitting in a therapy office with tears running down his face. Of every twisted thing that's happened in a life that is now in ruin. Because the enemy knew he couldn't control them in maturity. He yokes them in their youth. <laughs> Exposing kids to pornography when they have no ability to process what they're seeing. And then all of a sudden they enter a twisted world that now they have to hide from everybody all their life. And they live with the torment of knowing there's something about me that I can't let you see. It happened when they were early. <laughs> and it yokes them when they're older. I am preaching this thing right here. <laughs> to let them come through a cycle of poverty. I'm going to tell you, I came through that. It took me 10 years after I get married to kind of to understand my God was good. Yeah. It took me 10 years because all I saw was struggle. And that's why I didn't want to be a preacher because I saw my dad's life and I didn't like that part of it. I was so sick of us not having nothing, not being able to buy anything, not being able to go anywhere. <clears throat> One time my daddy did his taxes. And he went back and told the church board, he said, I qualify for food stamp. Church board said, well, you need to go get you something. That's the way we lived. So what did I want to do? I wanted to, get, I wanted to be a coach. I wanted to be a professional coach, and I wanted to get as far away from that world as I could. And it took me 10 years to just understand, my God is not wanting to see me struggle. My God is a good God. How, who knows your God is a good God? He has good plans for you. The Bible says, if you being evil give good gifts to your children, how much more will your God give good gifts to them that love him? Your God is a good God and every good and perfect gift comes down from above. So if any of you come out of that hardship of lack and struggle, let me tell you something. I break it now in the name of Jesus. Your God wants you blessed. Somebody shout amen. Ah, tap your neighbor and say, bless, bless, bless. Come on, say blessed. My son, who spent 12 years probably, and I feel like I spent a million dollars trying to get him off drugs, lost so much of his life, lost the first few years of his, with his kid, 
because of drug. It was given to him at 12. He said, Dad, it put a taste in my mouth that I could not shake. And then what happens? As he gets older, his life takes on the pattern of a drug addict. The only problem is when you get older, the consequences are higher. So when you're young, it's basically your problem. But when you're an adult, it's everybody's problem connected to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. These are the yokes. These are the things that happen. These are the things that usually happen in youth and things that happen in childhood. If you hadn't read my wife's book, Most Beautiful Disaster, she's talked about it many times. Raped and lost a virginity through a rape at age 15 and never told a soul. We didn't know it till our world was falling apart and I saw my wife fall into pieces and I didn't know what was wrong with her. And then it all comes out. Lost her virginity in a trailer to a rape with the guy that took her off and did that. Never told a soul. What happens? Yep. And your life takes on the pattern of the rape. Come on. Ah. So he says, the anointing destroys the yoke and removes the burden. Let me talk about the burden. Are you still with me? Did they still do the things for the baby care sales? I've been out of the baby business a while. Where they have the little care sales and all the little things dangling. You remember when they used to do that? Did they, is that still out there? Or is it now they're doing an iPad on the side of the crib? <laughs> <laughs> Had a man come in my office one time with his woman who was, uh, with, his, with his woman, with his wife who was in tears. And he was just a raging alcoholic. And he couldn't understand why she was so tore up about his problem. And I found me one of these care cells. I went to the nursery and got it. And I took one of those little animals and I pulled it. And when I pulled it, all of them shifted. I said, this is what you're doing to your family. This right here is you and everybody has to move to accommodate it. <laughs> That's the burden. The anointing destroys the, but it removes the burden because every yoke has a burden. Talk to the person whose gambling is out of control. And now they've been evicted from their house and they cannot qualify for a loan. And some places don't even handle it legally. They just somebody show up at your house because that's the burden. What's the, what's the, what's the, the yoke is promiscuity. You're promiscuous. What's the burden? The burden is soul ties and unwanted relationships and feeling devalued and feeling empty. And, and, and the Bible says, here's the thing about the anointing. <laughs> it breaks the power and it removes the burden that came with it. Everybody that has been yoked by anything, there is a burden. If it's a drug addiction, there's a burden. If it's a perverted or twisted lifestyle, there is a burden. If nothing else, just the burden of trying to maintain it or hide it from the people that love you. That's the burden of it. So God said, I'm not just going to break the thing off your neck. He said, but the weight that it is put on you and everybody around you, I'm going to lift that weight. That's why when Jesus came on the scene, look what he said. Take my yoke upon you ah, and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God said, let me take the reins of your life. Grow up into me because I'll lead you into the path of blessing. Come on, somebody. Oh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with all my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in his house forever. Shout hallelujah. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. You don't have to stay under that burden. You don't have to stay under that weight. There is an anointing in this room that has the ability to break that off your life forever. Shout hallelujah. Jesus. 
Uh, Look at your neighbor and say, give him five more minutes. gonna play it play it I gotta get this one out and then I'm gonna allow God to break some yokes I'm gonna skip the next one in Kings I'm gonna go to 2nd Samuel let's end with that one guys can I tell you something can I just be honest with you that I feel the weight of this message I can feel it. When I walked in here this morning, I knew there's, a, there's an element of plowing. Why? Because you got to walk across this stuff that hurts to get to the stuff that helps. And so you got to unearth it. They tell me that in the emergency room, they spend 80% of their time not fixing the wound, but cleaning it. And that's what the first part of this is. They've got to get in the wound. They've got to pick the scab. Let's clean this thing out a little bit now. Let's tie it up and sew it up and never come back here again. And that's what I'm trying to get to. I want to give you a biblical example because it's very important to me that when I when I preach something that may be new to you or may be a way that you've never heard it, that you get plenty of biblical insight and context to know that it's true. And the best example of this is with David. Saul was Israel's first king. Saul did evil in the, sight of, in the sight of the Lord, so God anointed a 12-year-old boy king. The book of Samuel is David's ascension from a boy to the throne. And once Saul actually had killed himself and David had taken over the throne, it was customary for a king to wipe out any of the former king's bloodline so that there would never be a threat of an uprising or a coup for the throne. But look what David does. David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I might show kindness? The last king was throwing spears at him trying to kill him. But look at the grace. Is there anybody in his family still alive so that I can be kind to them? Next verse, please. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. When they, called, uh, when they had called him to David, the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service, verse three. The king said, is there someone of the house of Saul to who I may show him the kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, and Lodabar. The word Lodabar means no communication. He's isolated and he talks to no one. Verse 4. Excuse me. Go on to the uh, next verse I gave you. I think it was verse 7. So David said to him, King Ziba was sent to go get him in Lodabar. He picked him up and brought him back to the palace. Now here is Saul's only remaining family member, Mephibosheth. And Ziba takes him and lays him in the palace. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will show you kindness. Mephibosheth thinks he's going to die. And will restore to you all the land Saul, your grandfather. And you shall eat bread at my table continually. Verse 8. Then he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Verse nine. Did I not give you verse nine? 
Go to chapter four and just stay there a moment. This is a powerful story of a yoke. <clears throat> There's a difference. Let me go here. David went and got Mephibosheth out of Lodabar and brought him to the palace. And now he's in a new place with an old problem. And even though there's a table set before him and he will eat at the king's table forever, he lays on the floor. He lays on the floor and even though he's been brought in as royalty and his father's land restored to him, he calls himself a dead dog. Why? How is a man so damaged that he lays in a palace and won't even get up and go to the table? Because they don't think he's worthy for it. This is his story. Jonathan saw a son who had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Zezreel. So there was a, a war about to break out. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. In his youth. And now God has brought him to a palace. But he still... Because you can be delivered, but damaged. <laughs> How did he get his issue? Because somebody he trusted dropped him. Where do most people's yokes come from? Because someone they trusted. Tr Have you ever had anybody you trusted drop you? You need to be careful because it's at the place you were dropped. And now he's a man living in Lodabar, won't speak to anybody. He gets brought to a palace. All his surroundings have changed. He can eat bread at the king's table and lays on the floor and calls himself a dog. Because his life did not change because you changed his geography. He's still trapped in what happened to him when he was five. <clears throat> Play something if you would, Terrence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The vast majority of you I've never had a chance to meet. It's hard when you take over a large church that's already established. When you build one from the ground up, you kind of get familiar with people. But when you take over one that existed over three decades before you got there, the dynamic's different. You have to know that I love you and that I care about you deeply just to preach stuff like this. I'm not talking about I'm an exclusive preacher. What I'm just saying, there just ain't people preaching this. They don't want to deal with the mess and the oh, and the power and the anointing and the break it. They don't want to deal with all that. Just, you know, baptize them and give them a t-shirt and tell them we got coffee over there. Just keep it pretty. This stuff ain't pretty. <laughs> but I can't, I can't let you come in a pretty place and keep your old problem. Surrounded by a palace, but views himself as a dog because of what yoked him in his youth, his whole life has taken on that pattern. The lack of value he found because of his handicap as a child followed him all the way through adulthood. If I could have somebody. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. I told you I'm probably going to do altar calls almost every single one of these series. I'm going to do one now. 
and I need you to get vulnerable and I need you not to care what anybody thinks because you want freedom more than what everybody's opinion but if you're in here and something happened to you young someone you trusted violated you young someone hurt you young something twisted happened to you young you were introduced to something way too young and the repercussions of that have followed you and for some of them it's much worse than follow maybe it's haunted you as it did my wife as it did Mephibosheth all the way to this day and you can't be the wife you want to be because of this yoke and you can't be the husband you want to be because of this yoke and you hear the words that I'm saying but you've got to the place can I ever really be free the anointing destroys the yoke today and it removes the burden and God wants to demonstrate that right here in these next few minutes and if one person will get up, I bet you 80 or 100 will get up. If that's you and something has followed you all the way to this day that hurt you in your youth, I want you to get up unashamedly and come down here with me right now. Boy, girl, man, woman, I don't care. I want you to come down here with me right now. <clears throat> come down here with me right now. We're going to stay here as long as we need to to let you get all the ministry you need. You can cry. I need people up here just passing out tissues. I'm already seeing tears flowing. I need some of our helps just to pass out tissues. I need all of my altar workers. I need all of my care pastors to come forward and be ready to minister. Praise team, whatever you want to, whatever you want to sing. I just need something worshipful. Those in the balcony will wait on you. Come on down here. Fill in around the front. Fill in around the front. You can stand, sit, kneel. You can do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter to me. I just want you to be free when you leave. I just want you to be free when you leave. I want you to be free when you leave. You're in a safe place, sweetie. You're in a safe place. Let it out. 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 That's all right. That's pain leaving. Come on, somebody. Freedom's here. Freedom's here today. Hallelujah. Here and now, Jesus, you change. Jesus, you change everything. Keep singing. I need my I need my care pastors. Start going through and releasing the anointing. Lay hands on them. Release the anointing.